Jenny, what a pleasure to have you here with us today. I wanted to ask about you. You're a feminine activist, uh, but tell me about the first sort of topless act you did. I think it was in defense of Amina. Why did you feel like you, you needed to come out topless and do that? Yes. I had started Feminine Sweden on Facebook already in the beginning of 2012 mm -hmm. and I was completely in the closet not showing anybody uh, that it was me sharing pictures from Feminine and news from Feminine and feminism in the world. and. Like in the end of 2012, I posted a photo uh, with me because I was so fed up with Facebook uh, blocking me and erasing me because of their problem with uh, women nipples. Mm. So I made a photo and it was really impossible to recognize me. I kind of covered all my face in Photoshop and changed things so nobody would possibly recognize me because I thought it was such a big thing. And then, just some month later, Amina started Femen in Tunisia and she was kidnapped and, and just disappeared. Mm -hmm. And I was so upset that the next morning when I woke up, I was like, it's, it's now. Mm -hmm. So I had my first photo made and it immediately became big, like 10,000 people just shared it immediately and magazines start contacting me. And then the thing with uh, Amina grew and you with other Iranians and Iranians in Sweden like Farid Arman and, um, and more Iranians in Sweden and also from some other countries from the Middle East uh, together with Femen uh, and you were speaking with Ina Chevchenko started the topless jihad. Mm -hmm. So my first time ever topless publicly in a, like a public place because I grew up in a time when in Sweden it was very normal to be topless on the beach. It's not so much today, but when I grew up it was it was like almost embarrassing to not be topless at some point. Um, but like this in a public space inside the city, it was definitely the first time and it was the first time for Farida too. And, uh, and this was uh, 4th of April 2013 that we started the Topless Jihad campaign and People were sending photos from all over Europe and the world in support doing the same. So that was that was my first time. And I mean, how did it feel being a feminine activist? I mean, uh, being topless, because as you said, it wasn't something that happened in the public space. And uh, I think it is quite uncomfortable for a lot of people when they first do it. Yes, yes, like, like I tried to describe with my first photo, it was really a big thing. And at that time I had already had two children and I was like older and I had a... It was difficult. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was taking sun in the garden I was always like having clothes close and if there was some hole somewhere I was checking, you know, it was a big thing. Mm -hmm. And I feel that it's really, really empowering part of Femen that today I have absolutely zero problem to just be topless wherever, whenever, in a second. Mm -hmm. So I feel really absolutely no problem with, um, with that sexism and objectification and also all the criticism especially of women bodies. Mm -hmm. And what was kind of the tipping point for that was that there was this same photo of me and uh, well, I'm old enough to not know how old I was at that time mm -hmm. but um, I don't know, maybe I was like 40, I don't know. And um, no, it can't be. I was more than 40. Um, so this photo of me from the feminine actions was out. And the typical thing when you want to attack a woman is to attack her body and how she looks. You know that that's how you can, you know, get to her. So, of course, all the racists, all the right wings, all the ones that were. Uh, against me, um, where it's especially a lot of male trolls, they were all saying that my breasts were ugly, that they were too old, I was too old, my breasts were too saggy, this was, this was like a lot of those comments. But, in the same time, the same photo was used by a journalist in a big, uh, in a big um, newspaper, where she was writing that uh, I and Femen could not be taken serious, because I was too young and too beautiful and my breasts were too perfect and it was the same picture. 
So I really realized that this has nothing to do with me and how I look or anything. This has only got to do with their master suppression techniques and knowing that it's on a woman you always go on, on her looks. There's a couple of uh, trials you've been taken to. You've been taken to court for some of your actions. Yes. Uh, and some of them were quite dangerous as well, weren't they? Uh, tell us about, well, one of them, um, uh, I think you've been fined on a number of occasions um, uh, at the mosque. Yes, uh, we made um, Ali Al Mahdi led an action in the Stockholm mosque in uh, in the weekend that it was the big uh, one year protest of against Mursi. He had been in power for one year. I think it was like 70 million people in the streets in in Egypt out protesting. And Alia has asylum here since she was part of the Arabian Spring and was one of the bloggers and, and went out topless. And she also made the first feminine photo ever in Sweden in, uh, in 2012, also against uh, Sharia and, and theocracy. And um, she wanted to make something. So she shoes, uh, like the capital, Stockholm, she shoes the biggest mosque and it's a mosque that has connections with the Muslim Brotherhood, as does Mursi. Uh, of course, it was very controversial in Sweden because this, yeah, <laughs> you can imagine. Um, but and she led it, and then it was also uh, Maryam from from Tunisia who lives in France, and then it was me, and it was my first big action. And uh, so it was a Friday morning, and we got in. And it was, I think it was like 10 men there. And they immediately scared away all the journalists and photographers that had come there to, to, to document the action. So we were left alone inside mm -hmm. uh, without any journalist or without any photographer. And they are very much our security when we do a, a feminine action because they can document what's, what's happening mm -hmm. and people know that it's being documented so they keep calm. Mm -hmm. So it was really tense, but we stayed there and, and all the way until the police came like 20, 30 minutes later. And it was going front and back because some of them were very calm and like not doing anything bad. And some were aggressive and wanted to attack us and the calm ones calmed them down. It was moving front and back. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, they said we were um, a bad fucked horse from hell. And then an interesting thing was that when the police came, they said that I was the leader. Mm -hmm. Because they have this strange kind of racism, thinking that it had to be me that was the blonde Swede that was the leader, mm -hmm. and not the most small and most quiet, mm -hmm. very peaceful Ali al yeah. yeah. And uh, so you were fined for that, yes. as well as for... Um, for uh, we made, shortly after, we made an action um, this was in the time that Putin installed the so-called anti-gay law in mm -hmm. Russia, mm -hmm. together with Kirill. And, um, and uh, right in, in this summer it started to appear videos where uh, homophobes in Russia tricked homosexual guys to come to meetings and then they tortured them and filmed it and, and um, it was out on the net. Mm -hmm. So. Um, well, first, the day before, we made an action together with the Iranians uh, in Stockholm, the ex-Muslims, um, against, the, against the regime in Iran, of course, but also in support of the, the LGBTQ community that escape as refugees to Sweden and, and need um, asylum and is not getting enough support from here. So, so that was the first, and yeah, I just want to say, like, it's been all the way since my first action in Sweden, always been the Iranians who, who's been supporting us the most and really understood what we're doing and what is the danger and why are we doing this. So first we made this demonstration with them, topless, in Stockholm during Pride. And then the next day, me and Alia climbed this three meter fence and got in the Russian embassy. And I was afraid before because uh, I know that when you get when I got in, when we got in, we were not on Swedish territory anymore. So it was Russian laws, 
and I was also told like this is the embassy in Sweden that has more weapon than any other embassy and I was I mean I was thinking that this can be my last day they can shoot me if they want so uh, nothing happened but it was scary I left my daughter in in the in the morning and like said goodbye and I was afraid um, so this this I was also fined for and uh, it was beautifully paid the fines by Elisabeth Olsson Wallin that is like our super duper uh, activist photographer in Sweden that I really like a lot mm -hmm. and um, she's been doing a lot of exhibitions for for gay rights and and uh, when we were in the trial of the Russian embassy I used I used the trials as a way to again tell our message so I think it's good to go to trials because then we get a second chance after the action and after after the news and after the articles uh, so it's a lot of job after an action to follow up with all the news and then in the trial you get one more chance to tell your message so that was good and uh, immediately after we just went straight out and got ready to go do an action and a photo in the Catholic Church because and the day after there would be huge demonstrations in Madrid because it was when the Spanish uh, more and more fascist government uh, was uh, trying to cut on the abortion rights mm -hmm. and this is all in connection with the Catholic Church and, uh, and the Vatican. So we wanted to make a, a support photo in the Catholic Church and it was not really supposed to be an action, we just wanted to do the photo in the church. But it became an action because they got so violent and so angry uh, and tried to put plastic bags over our head and dragged our hair and and uh, Elizabeth was there and she got some photos when the the priest was holding my mouth and also uh, like strangling me and it got really powerful photos and it was all over the news on, on on the first page the next day so she got paid for this photo and it exactly covered the fines for the for the <laughs> oh, Russian embassy. Yeah. So that was beautiful. So why why do you keep doing it when it can be quite risky? And I mean, you you know, you're talking about not knowing if you're going to get home that evening. Why would you carry on doing it? I cannot think of the world uh, that I will leave to my children, especially to my daughter, um, if things get worse and I've already seen that it's got worse because Sweden was a lot different when I grew up so I don't know I guess I could write a, a book about that and I don't really have the answer because that would have to explain who I am as a person and everything and I can't really I can't fully explain why I do this but I just know that I cannot not, not do it <laughs> yeah and how do you think topless activism fits in to general activism? I mean, I mean, because you know there are lots of criticism about why mm. would you use your body? Because it's but your body is already being used for profit and this and that. Why mm. would you use it in protest? Well, for me, I I was not only a politician. I was an artist, and I had worked for a long time already with um, uh, with. Um, paintings with the female body and it had been more about my own process of you know of relations and also of me as a woman in society so I had already been painting this kind of paintings uh, like without clothes uh, but without being um, about being looking beautiful more like the message of the body and uh, this was one of the things that I liked so much when I found Femin. I started Femin Sweden on Facebook like in 15 minutes after I read about them the first time. Because I liked, I liked this way of uh, using, um, of not seeing the woman's body and not seeing, if you see it as sexual or not, I mean that's up to me. Uh, if, if I'm feeling sexual or not, it, I don't really care if you think I'm sexy or not, it's not relevant to me. But if I feel sexy even that way, I still have the right to, to be sexy without anybody raping me or thinking that, uh, that they have any right to, to abuse me. 
So this was of course something that I liked when I saw Femen using it as an empowerment tool instead of something that we should hide and, and adopt. Because I think it's very sexist when, when somebody say, um, why are you showing your breasts? I'm like, why are you saying that I'm showing my breasts? I'm not showing my breasts, I'm just not covering myself. Uh, because they don't say that about a man. They don't tell a man, why are you showing your tits? Mm. It's, it's, it's even in the word use, you see that there is a sexist way of looking at a woman. So I think immediately in that attitude, you discover that the person asking this question is shaped by sexism. And I should not adapt to that sexism. I should not let my life being run or ruled by... by somebody's, your sexist, uh, skewed uh, worldview. Yeah. And finally, I mean, uh, you're doing, uh, you, you are an artist, so you're doing portraits, uh, you're doing, uh, uh, you've done quite a few paintings already of feminine goddesses. Why are you doing that? What's, what's the message behind that? I was already doing body prints before, and these paintings are also made with body prints. And before I didn't make them with the real person. It was just a body print and then I invented a person to tell the story I wanted to tell. But now I'm doing portraits, so I am gathering these body prints from the most radical activists in feminist activists in the world, that is Femen. I, you cannot find more radical feminist activists in the world. And uh, I gather these body prints and then I, I make the portrait on their print. And um, I want to, to honor these women and activists that have shaped my life. All my life has completely changed since then, since, then, since I started with Femen. And I know I can die just, you know, anytime. So this is something I want to do before I die. I want to honor Femen. And the name Femen Goddesses is because we always, we always love to, to fight for blasphemy. And we have so many actions since Josephine went in the Kölner Dome in Christmas and just jumped up and had this text of I am God standing up there behind a priest. So we have this I am God. So I think feminine goddesses is both honoring us and in the same time mocking this thing of patriarchy thinking that they have a monopoly on who is God and the monotheism and, and all this. So think the name is good and what is interesting for me I have discovered that my first paintings with body prints were kind of small so it didn't really fit a face and it was not so important because my message was about the body but later they got bigger and they started having a face and I just realized even later that the timing of my painting starting to have a face and a head was the same time as I got in feminine and now to make the, the feminine goddesses portraits, they are even bigger because feminine activists are taking <laughs> more space because we also use the arms and the body. And I have realized like I would even need to do them like two by two meters because we also use, you know, the legs and the feet. So the whole process for me, when I look at how my paintings have been developing, it's been about taking space. Thank you so much. Thank Tony. you.